Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with Jeff Richard, the creative director of Chaosium, and we talked about fantasy. The topic of the video was what is fantasy? So I started off the interview by telling Jeff that fantasy was any story with swords and magic in it. And our conversation goes off from there. Now, eagle-eyed viewers are gonna notice that there is some background changes behind me during the video. It's my fault. We got very into our conversation and I started to ramble a little bit. So I've cut down some of the things that I said for brevity, but the full conversation and the points that we make are still there. Before I jump across to the interview, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It helps us out and it lets us make more content like this. Thanks for watching. Yeah, because, that, and that's a problem. That's a problem. Fantasy doesn't get any respect because um, you know, two things. One is it always gets the crappiest location in the library or in the in the bookstore, right? You know, you get you get you get the the pride of place to the um, to fiction, which of course uh, an awful lot of fiction is 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 actually. Uh, I'm going to be played literary critic here. An awful lot of it isn't very good. It's it's you know it's a lot of stories of of self discovery blah 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 blah, um, very uh, often very formulaic. So you know how there there there's my snob bit. Then you get science fiction. Science fiction gets um, which actually in my opinion science fiction is part of fantasy, but it's considered slightly more respectable than than fantasy. And then at that then you get fantasy. And fantasy, you know, it's it's it, it it seems to be a dumping ground for lengthy franchises, you know, books that that are 12, 12 or 15 volumes into it that have elves and and wizards with pointy st uh, staffs and and have uh, uh, you know are under the shadow of Tolkien's masterpieces. But you know, there very few of them are Tolkien uh quality but they they are are constrained by that and you know take it a step further then we 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 think about fantasy on television and that tends to be lower budget um stuff almost always filmed in new zealand right isn't that where we we film most of our and the point is is that what we but as you go down this um we we get this impression that fantasy is you know ultimately it's it's um, about elves, Scottish dwarves, um, uh, a you know a noble either a noble fighter or a barbarian fighter, um, etc. Handful of, of of regular archetypes, and and I guess what I'm saying is that's not fantasy at all. Or if to the extent it is fantasy, it's a tiny, limited um, cul-de-sac of, of fantasy. Call of Cthulhu, that's fantasy. Horror is fantasy. Uh, the Expanse, that's fantasy. Playing around with ideas and possibilities. You know, what does it mean in a setting where people have magic what are gods what is chivalry what is the future of humanity what are we going to be like in a thousand years that's that's all fantasy and and to me you know that's that's the the incredible door that fantasy role playing lets us get into I like the interpretation of fantasy as being anything imaginative, anything dealing with questions about what would it be like to X, Y, Z. Where does fantasy stop and fiction begin? Would it be fair to say that, you know, a, a traditional, you know, fiction novel uh, would be, sorry, a, a traditional fantasy novel could be Pride and Prejudice. It's imagining what would it be like if I lived in, you know, uh, England at that, at that time. Okay, am I, am I cynical? A view of what divides the two is marketing and your agent. Uh, you want to be called. You want to be able to be called um, uh, fiction because you get invited to the better parties and you're more likely to get a prestigious award if it's fiction as opposed to fantasy. But you know, some of the great fantasy writers. Neil Stevenson is a fantasy writer. He's over in the fiction uh, department um, in in your bookstore, but he's writing. Uh, most of his books, Anathem, um, the Baroque trilogy, Snow Crash, uh, Cryptonomicon—that's all. That's that's all fantasy. 
Um, similarly, I'd say Umberto Eco, a lot of Umberto Eco's books are fantasy. Certainly Bottolino was a fantasy book. Uh, and uh, of course it's Professor Umberto Eco, so it got classified as fiction, but it's fantasy. And, and it's one of the things that, that, that the reason this is something I care about, and I think it's worth, worth us thinking about is, is when we deal with role-playing games, when we deal with this, this, this hobby that um, we're all into, we should be really willing to let our imagination run wild, not just in terms of what our obstacles are or, or the convoluted plot that you know, our, our players may get involved in or our role-playing scenery, but, but dealing with the, the ideas and the themes um, that, that run underneath the game and underneath our stories. And, and that to me is at the very core of, of fantasy. You know, they, it's, it's psychological. Uh, fantasy deals with stuff and, and fantasy deals off and it gives us a vehicle for us to deal with uncomfortable or even frightening topics, death, um, it, it, death, um, love, cruelty, change, um, order, truth, lies, um, uh, uh, social structure, etc. We can safely explore these themes, and you know, these are a lot of these are really they're frightening. I mean, death is a terribly frightening thing for us to explore. Uh, it's, it, and, and in fantasy, we can do that. We can ask the question, Hey, what happens next? And we can play around with ideas in a, in a, um, in a fun way. So taking this idea of fantasy as a way of putting yourself into a story and playing a role for want of a better word, how do some of the most popular books that we all know and love allow you to do that? So in almost all fantasy, we're playing around with, with archetypes. Um, you know, if we want to be Jungian about it, we, we would say these are the, the subconscious or unconscious patterns by which we human beings understand the world. And, you know, we, we, we play around with these archetypes and, and sometimes subvert them, sometimes run wild with them. Um, but we do these in ways that aren't constrained uh, by the real world. And I'm going to put that in quotation marks because the real world is probably a lot broader than a lot of the rules of fiction uh, say it is. But, you know, we can go, we can be James Bond. We can be a, 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 a secret agent with a license to kill. Um, we can, and, and then we can explore, you know, in the old uh, Ian Fleming novels, you're, a, a big part of those stories is what a miserable life James Bond lives. You know, it, he, he's, he's, he's one martini away from a heart attack in half of the, uh, in, in half the original stories. Uh, we can play, we, we, we play around with these um, archetypes, but we're in a a world that is not strictly our own to a greater or lesser degree. So like, you know, when we do a horror story, um, certainly if it's dealing with the mythos, it's not our world. C Cthulhu does not lurk at the bottom of our South Pacific ocean. You know, there is not, there are not cults capable of summoning elder things from, from, the, from the void, but we can play around with a lot of themes through that fantasy. Let me pull you back to traditional fantasy, that narrow understanding of fantasy. I love fantasy. I know you do. I love Tolkien. I love Lorantha. I love, uh, you know, all kinds of these great worlds that are out there. Do you have anything to say in kind of, I suppose, in defense of these worlds and that genre as a valid and important aspect of the larger literary canon? Oh, I think, I, don't get me wrong, I think Tolkien is a, a, a deserved part of the Western literary canon. I think, it's, I think that Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and The Cimmerillion are all first-tier important books. These, they, they're cultural, 
and literary masterpieces. I'm not talking about Tolkien. Actually, I think Tolkien is an example of amazing fantasy. I'm talking about people that, that, that can't see beyond the construct that Tolkien created. All right, if, the, if that makes any sense. So, you know, oh, well, there's this masterpiece. So when we have a, when we, we're, we're, I'm writing my fantasy story or I'm playing my fantasy um, role-playing game or whatever it is, don't I have to operate within the parameters that uh, Tolkien created? And of course, we you you know usually when you see this, they're not even operating within the full parameters. I, One Ring is a fantastic game. I I I'm a I love gaming in Middle Earth, um, but if we're going to play around with Tolkien's themes, let's do it with Tolkien's setting. Let's 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 do it that way. What what we instead we see is we see a tremendous amount of of derivative Tolkien. It's not Tolkien. It's not an exploration of, of the English language and uh, an attempt to create a, an old English epic tale uh, or playing around with, with uh, 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 Tolkien's interests in, in mythology and, um, and you know, that, that Cimmerillion is actually my favorite, even though uh, my wife can't stand it. But um, it's my favorite uh, uh, Tolkien book because it's just this collection of just wild imaginary stories that riff off mythology, uh, that rip off world, uh, riff around, not rip off, riff around mythology and, and at the same time have uh, Tolkien's fascination with, with Old English and Old English literature. That's great stuff. What, what, Unfortunately, it's so great that an awful lot of people are afraid to do their own thing, which is, you know, one of the great examples of someone who did do their own thing is, is Michael Moorcock with uh, The Eternal Champion, which is, in, again, actually, I think Moorcock is, is another major contributor to, to Western literature. But that's totally different. It's a totally different story, totally different themes, totally different setting, totally different tropes, totally different set of questions that um, uh, that that Moorcock is playing around with than Tolkien is. And and I guess you know to get back to your question, the the concern I have with traditional fantasy is is that it's people tend to limit themselves with what they should be, what they're capable of doing with their imagination when they stick to what they think fantasy is about. Let me ask you for a few crystallized points, some takeaways. Say that I come into this uh, interview and I, uh, you know, leave with a new appreciation of the broad range of fantasy. What are some takeaways I can I can bring with me some practical information that I can use to make my tabletop games or you know my writing my whatever more engaging more imaginative freer psychology um no I'd start right there that 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 um fantasy is about our psychology it, it's it's about hitting um themes and ideas that are often uh, dangerous or fearful to play around with in the real world, right? And I, we, we, you can hit that with any of our games. Call of Cthulhu is a psychological game. It's, that's at its very core. It's the fear. Um, it's, you know, it's the fear of the unknown combined with the fear that the universe, the, that the universe, will, the universe is hostile to humanity, right? That's right at the very core of it. And those are, you know, those are fears that everybody has one level or another, um, but we can explore that in a role-playing game. Glorantha, Glorantha is chock full of, of psychological themes of, of, you know, what happens when we die? What's the relationship between, the, between us living in a, the mundane material world and with the, with the, with the realm of gods and spirit and myth. What's, what, what's the relationship between those? Pandergen as well is a psychological game. Fantasy at its core is let's create 
a, a fantastic imaginary environment where we can safely play around with um, uh, psychological themes. And by, by safely, I, I mean, you know, when I deal with death in a role-playing game, nobody's dead. It's a fictional construct. When I deal with the questions of, well, what happens to my, my fictional imaginary character when they die in a role-playing game in, in, in Glorantha, I don't necessarily have to be challenging my own personal religious beliefs. You know, it's, we're, we're playing around this in the, in the, um, the realm of, of the imagination of, of what Einstein called thought experiments. I, and, uh, you know, to where we are playing around with this without their necessary, without us necessarily having to worry about the, the, the real world consequences of it. And, and to me in a role playing game, playing around with these things, these, these difficult choices um, or psychological themes, that's what sh we should be trying to, to, uh, to aim for. Because it's they're fun, they're fascinating, they're engaging. Um, you know, people uh, in a recent game that I was running, people spent a half hour. The players spent a half hour to an hour debating the fate of a a trollkin, a little tiny um, twisted little troll that surrendered to them, right? Because they killed all the other trolls. So the troll going ah, and so they debated, what do we do? And, and they had a wonderful time because they were, it was raising questions of what is honorable, um, what is hate, what is loyalty, what would, you know, what is the, and, and in real world, I, none of us would want to have these questions to deal with, but in a fantasy, we can. This actually reminds me a lot of the discussion that we had about balance. So I'm going to link it in the video description in the same way that there's a very narrow definition of balance, but you can broaden it out to be able to do a lot more interesting things there seems to be a very narrow definition of fantasy but once broadened out you can see all of these other really interesting aspects yeah, well it reminds me of um back in the late 80s early 90s there was a um, literary analysis of of romance novels called uh, i think it was called reading the romance and it was talking about the formal constraints in the romance novels of the time you know, and, and why do a lot of, or did, I mean, I think actually romance writing is, is, is dramatically improved mm. in the last 20, 20, 30 years and is, is really um, becoming, uh, well, it's become, not becoming, it's become a really major um, literary, uh, literary genre that it gets no respect, all, except for the big fat paychecks that I'm sure that the publishers bring home. But um the, the, the thing in that was that it has an incredibly or had an incredibly constraining formal structure of how stories were supposed to progress. And the audience would give feedback saying, well, we don't like it when stories go a different, you know, go outside of this framework. And I think that there's a, there's a tremendous problem with fantasy as a literary genre because there is a, a set of formal constraints that the audience thinks that it wants. Um, and, and RPGs have the same issue. That there's a very limiting uh, formal constraint. Uh, that it, and the crazy thing is, is, is that it's, it's not required. And I actually don't think the audience really wants it. It's more something that it's something that they think they want. It's like comfort food. I, I, I get you. And it, it, it's so interesting because it's the same with um, uh, like the three act structure and stuff like that. You know, all the really rigid rules applied to film um, specifically, you know, the, oh, the, yes. way that, the way that Vogler took took um, uh, the hero's journey and applied it like super. Oh, rigid. yeah. And, and actually, although I, I, I totally understand what he was trying to do there, then what happens is, is that you get um, you know, you get studios and, and financiers that go, okay, well, this is this is the punch list that has to be in every one of these stories. And of course, you know, you read your Campbell and the and the, the, the hero's journey is not present in every myth. It's a composite. It's a yes. synthetic 
It's a, syn a synthesis of a whole bunch of stories. Hey, if we create a monomyth, so like a single story with the elements of all of the stories, what does that look like? Okay, that's the hero's journey. Yeah. But not every, not every story is supposed to have that be the hero's journey. And maybe it only has a couple parts of it. Um, and, it's, and yeah. It's the great it's tragedy of, of finding something that works and then... Um, uh, you know, copying it again and again and again until you've filed off everything that worked about it. And I think that there's sort of like arcs in arts where people do it for long enough until they get to a new version and then something else takes over. It's the bureaucratization of art. And we, we see that a lot. You see that, you know, at the big level, we see that with um, with movies. You know, we've, we, we're, we're, we're seeing that with the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies uh, where yeah. they they... The, the wildness of some of the early films, you know, Iron Man was an insane film. It should never have been made. It, it, it's a fantastic film. But now, you know, there's so much money lying on that, uh, uh, relying on this and so many people's jobs at this that it's bureaucratized. And, you, see, you know, that's at the most extreme level of it. But you see this it filter down to, to areas like um, fantasy literature and fantasy role-playing games. There's a, you know, there's a, a, an inherent tendency to bureaucratize things. And once it becomes bureaucratized, you create formal, you start creating these formal structures, which initially are there, you know, as a, as a support, you know, it's a guide yeah. rail to help, but of course it's only a guide rail. We can, we can jump off it when we feel the need to. It, and it changes from being a, um, a support to a prison. I talked before about how I spent some time in India studying narratology at a screenwriting university. One of the things I thought was really interesting there is they talked about the Raza, which is a Indian narratological structure. And they talked about how all of these famous American filmmakers had been using the Raza. And I was thinking a lot of the time that I don't know if these filmmakers would have been aware of the Raza. So it really does seem like it's all structure. It's that's kind of synthetic uh, subconscious that you've been talking about. And, and, and for what it's worth in, in traditional Indian literature, there is some incredibly um, developed thoughts about the formal structure of, of poetry, of literature, of music, mm. uh, and, and really, really amazing remarkable stuff it's um in the in the western world i guess you have to go to aristotle for for anything that is similar and it you know in yeah. in a pre-modern sense but um yeah the the actually something else i would suggest for folk along fantasy is watch some scorsese Watch some some people. Right, Taxi Driver is a fantasy. It's a you know, and we even have an unreliable narrator throughout it. I mean, De Niro's character. Do we do we trust anything um, in 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 his perception of what's going on? The guy's a pill popping lunatic. Um, you know, did he actually kill all those people? Did he not? Uh, they pretty much were the only thing that we know for certain in that story is he is a taxi driver and that he got a letter from the girl's parents. And that's about it. That's the, the you know, but it's, it plays around with, with so many dark themes in there, you know, watch some Scorsese, watch some, watch some Coppola, man, you know, go broad and and it, and that's one of the great things if you start interpreting fantasy broadly then you can legitimately pull in uh, and, and draw on all sorts of other influences and ideas